Hi, I'm Cameron McKenzie. I'm the editor-in-chief over at theserverside.com and I wanted to help you answer 10 of the most commonly asked Git and GitHub questions. So the first question that you might get if you're on a DevOps interview is what is the difference between Git and GitHub? For that question, I would say that Git is the tool that is installed locally and allows developers to manage code, manage commit histories, uh, go back over previous versions of code, and even potentially connect to other Git repositories through push and pull commands. But it really is a tool that's installed locally on a developer's machine. GitHub, on the other hand, is a cloud-based offering that wraps around the Git tool and allows developers to connect to it uh, online, push their code to it, uh, almost create a, a centralized place in many respects for, for storing source code. Now, I do like to emphasize Git is a distributed version control tool as well as GitHub, so we don't want to think of Git or GitHub as a centralized tool, but I think people understand when you say, yeah, that's typically the central place where people on a project would push their code to, that being GitHub. Uh, also, GitHub provides a variety of services around Git. So Git is very focused on version control and managing a commit history, but you know, integrating with third-party tools and even doing things like user management and authentication, Git doesn't deal with that. So uh, tools like GitHub, they wrap tools around that basic Git offering. Question two, uh, name two Git commands that are not supported by GitHub Desktop. So the GitHub Desktop is good for helping people get started with GitHub repositories, cloning, pushing, pulling, even doing versioning. But some of the advanced features like cloning, or not cloning, but cherry picking, reverting, and rebasing, those still aren't built into the GitHub Desktop tool. Now that may change over time, but if you really want a, a full suite of features, you know, you can stick with Git GUI, even maybe, you know, Atlassian's offering in that space. Those are all really great full feature tools. What are the four states that can be applied to a commit using the GitHub status API? Well, of course, just because your code can be committed, that is, there's no merge conflicts, or at least you've resolved the conflicts and pushed the code into your repository, that doesn't mean that the code compiles. And even if the code compiles, that doesn't mean all the unit tests pass. So the API allows you to push code into GitHub and mark it with one of four states. That's error, failure, pending, and success. The fourth question, name three popular DevOps tools with which GitHub commonly integrates. Uh, well, let me see. What are some of the tools that it integrates with well? Uh, you'll typically, in a DevOps environment, integrate with Jira. Uh, you'll definitely be integrating with a, a build tool like Maven or Gradle. Uh, of course, if you're doing continuous integration, you're going to be using a tool like Jenkins. Uh, so those are just a, a handful of tools that uh, you might be integrating your GitHub repository with. Fifth question: What does the Git horn? What does the GitHub unicorn indicate? Well, of course, uh, unicorns are very rare. Some may say they don't even exist. And if you actually see a GitHub unicorn on your GitHub page, that means the GitHub page is down. It's the rainbow unicorn. So hopefully you won't see that, and hopefully GitHub won't be down for any reason. But if it does go offline for a little while, they float that GitHub unicorn onto the page. It's pretty cute. Sixth question, what is the key motivation for a paid GitHub subscription? Uh, until early 2019, the motivation was to get a private repository. So uh, formerly, you couldn't get a private repository without paying for a GitHub subscription. If you just use the basic free account, all of the source code that you checked in would be public for others to see. Uh, so if you wanted something to be private, you would have to pay the, I think it's only five or six dollars a month, it's not really expensive, but you'd have to get a developer subscription to GitHub. Uh, they actually changed that in 2019. As of January 2019, you can actually create a private repo with a basic free account. However, there are some restrictions. So one restriction is you can't do branch protection rules with it. You can't get a wiki with it. You can't get GitHub pages. 
And perhaps the most restrictive one, the a private GitHub repository on the free tier can only have three collaborators with it. So uh, if you want more than three contributors to your project, uh, you're going to have to go to the paid subscription. Seventh question, name two technical insights GitHub provides about repositories. Uh, that's the, the good old insights page. Uh, Pulse is interesting. It tells you the number of merged pull requests, proposed pull requests, closed issues, issues that have arisen. Uh, there's a GitHub traffic where it can tell you how many repository views have happened over the time, how many times the repo has been cloned, um, how many users have cloned the repositories, uh, which files in the repo are most popular. So there's a, a variety of, of insights you can get about your repository through the insights page. There's also links for information about contributors, community commits, code frequency, network insight, forks, all interesting things that GitHub can provide you about your repository. Question 8. How can you stop an idle-minded developer from accidentally pushing a bad commit to the master branch? Uh, well, the answer to that is use branch protection rules. So you can, uh, this is something GitHub provides, you can't do it at the level of Git, but you can say, hey, you know what, um, for this particular branch it requires a pull request before merging, or uh, we need a GitHub API status check before merging, or we can require a signed commit, um, or even include just administrator, administrators in branch protection rules. Um, so there's a, a variety of ways that we can protect our branches. Um, but that's the key. GitHub provides branch protection rules so that an idle-minded developer or somebody who's not paying attention can't accidentally uh, push a bad commit to the master branch. Question 9, what's the purpose of a GitHub interaction limit? Well, things can get heated when you're doing development and to uh, avoid people flaming each other or allow your project to cool down. Uh, GitHub allows you to set some interaction limits and uh, uh, you can limit uh, interactions to only new users. Um, you can set GitHub interaction limits where uh, only people who have ever made a commit can interact with each other. Um, you can place a limit so that uh, uh, all users who do not have push access to the repo uh, can't interact with what's going on in the repo. Um, but that's the basic idea. If, uh, if you want to reduce the number of people that are interacting with your GitHub repository, maybe there's a, a little disfaction going on, dissatisfaction going on in the community, the GitHub interaction limits are the key. And finally, the tenth question, where in a GitHub project can you use a GitHub emoji? Uh, all of the millennials want to use emojis as much as possible. Uh, right now you can use them in labels. So you can put a, a cute little emoji in your label as you label your commits. Uh, we may see more and more places where that's available. Uh, kind of a, a cute, neat little feature. Anyways, that's it. Uh, hopefully this will help you get through any DevOps interview where you need to answer some questions on Git or GitHub. Uh, for more information on Git and various DevOps tools, head over to theserverside.com and feel free to follow me on Twitter at Cameron McKenzie.